Support the Dungeon Masters Dojo by heading over to Apple Podcasts and Podchaser and leave a review. Take the time to leave a comment as well. This helps make us more searchable to those listeners interested in content such as ours. But more importantly, we want to know how we are doing and what topics you would like to hear about. Another way you can support the DMD is by buying the DMD a beer so we can continue to deliver quality content to you, our listeners. This also helps us upgrade and replace equipment. Head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the DMD and buy us a beer or three or five. Don't forget to say something nice or mean. We don't care. You're buying us a beer. Now on to this week's episode. Welcome back to the dojo. This week, we're going to continue our dive into the party splitting. So pull up a stool, grab your ale, because it's splitting the party part three. How to run it effectively this week on the Dungeon Masters Dojo. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Dungeon Masters Dojo podcast. This is a show for game masters and players alike. We hope to bring you tips and tricks to elevate your game and develop the art of dungeon mastery. I'm your host, Louis Aponte, and these are your dungeon masters, Scott Labby and Bill Robitaille. Let's head to the dojo and see what they have in store for us today. Bill, Scott, how's everything going? Good. This is uh, take two. Now that the uh, <laughs> unforeseen occurrence has been handled, we are back at it and in the studio. The Lyceum has a uh, a small, brand new... Familiar. Uh, f- familiar, yes. Our our rust monster puppy has been tearing about. <laughs> yes. Uh, thundering down the stairs, thundering up the stairs. It's a, a newly acquired skill. That he just learned That he today. just <laughs> learned. And, uh, and wants to exercise it as often as possible. Yes, and there's all sorts of wonderful wiggly wires to put in your mouth, too, which is not, <laughs> not good. So, yes, he is, uh, he is upstairs guarding the dojo. So effectively running a party that's split. We are absolutely running a split party now Mm -hmm. with um, the infant rust monster being our vanguard upstairs. We we went over why not to do it, and then we went over why you should split your party. So now it's how to do it effectively. Yes, because that's important. Right. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it effectively because we all know how to do it ineffectively. We already talked about that. Yeah, that is very (laughs) easy. But how do you split the party effectively and and have it be something that's going to add to your story and your table and your players and not detract from all of that? And that can be tricky. It's tricky. And I think first and foremost, you got to have a good reason. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're you're writing this big scenario. Well, I, we mentioned already in the previous episode, write in the split. Write in a reason for the, the groups to be, or an individual or a couple, to be split off. Send them off on, you know, for a particular reason. If you've already planned for it, it's not a surprise. And if they do deviate a little bit, you've already made some concessions and some plans for just that. So it doesn't catch you unawares. I think if you have a good reason, just make sure the reason fits into the storyline. Yeah, is it going to further it? Is it going to do something to uh, enrich the tale, right? You don't thunder down the basement stairs and then back up just because you can. (laughs) Unless you're a baby rust monster. (laughs) You... um, and you shouldn't split the party just because you because can. You can, yeah, um, because it'll it'll become an overused trope. I I wholeheartedly agree. the The splitting of the the party is very effective way to we've already mentioned to draw in tension to build some suspense, introducing NPCs. There's a number of different reasons why, but. Doing so that, like you said, it's got to further the storyline. It's got to give you something to work off of, work with, or work towards. And whether it's for the storyline, whether it's for the personal 
storylines for individual characters or, you know, even if it's just one or if it's to help the, the grand scheme, but it should be somewhat apparent from the get go. Yeah. Even if not, the whole story is, is unveiled. It should be, you know, so we need this person where we, we need to go find this people, but we can't all go. We have to do this as well. Well, all right. Who's best for th- each task? And the party will decide and let them split. If you're a decent game master and you know your party well, you pretty much ahead of time are going to know who's going to do what. Yeah, and and ask yourself the question, is this necessary? When you're planning out your adventure, your session, your campaign, whatever, and you're thinking, I'm going to split the party or I'm going to make it necessary for the party to split, then... Ask yourself if it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Is this really necessary? And if the answer is no and you just think it'd be cool, then don't do it. Exactly. Um, because it won't turn out to be cool and it'll it'll backfire on you. And that and that sucks. And that can be discouraging too when, when that sort of thing happens because you would be reluctant to do it in the future, especially if you're an inexperienced GM, right? You try something, it doesn't come off well. Well, I guess I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. Um, which is a huge mistake. It is. It huge is. mistake because you should be trying this. But plan. Plan, you know, how is it going to execute? Hopefully you got a, a decent grasp on who you have at your table and how the different people play. So if I split this up and these two people go this way and these three go this way, how do I think these two are going to react? How have they reacted in the past? will give you a pretty good idea of how they're going to react now. And uh, same with the other group. So then you can cater your encounter for those people. Now, if it changes a little bit, okay, it changes. Maybe for whatever reason they decide, well, no, I've decided tonight I don't like Lou. So I'm going to go with Scott instead. Well, why don't you like Lou? Um, I don't know. I just don't like Lou tonight. He thunderwaved me. Yeah, he thunderwaved me three Again. weeks ago, and then uh, two weeks ago, and then last week. So I'm not going with Lou anymore because he keeps thunderwaving me. He's dangerous. Don't, don't stand in my way. I usually yell. What do I yell? Thunderwave. Thunder and if you're going to stand there, what's going to happen? You're going to get thunderwaved. Yeah. And unfortunately, you could be standing directly behind him, still get thunderwaved. Yeah. You're not anywhere a, you know in his way, um, and his. His uh, one-second warning of thunder wave, get out of my way. It's not my initiative. Too bad. <laughs> and when it's inside of a Leoman's tiny hut. Yes. Oh, that was a grand it's... one. <laughs> Splatter marks on the walls from all the NPCs, and half the PCs were barely alive. Thank you, Lou. That was great. Did it, blow the, did it blow the door off like you thought it would? Nope. Nope. It's like farting in a metal can. <laughs> And only worse and then lighting it <laughs> no that's worse that's, yeah that's what you did thank you Lou. so one of the keys right is to keep the time the party is split to a minimum that's going to alleviate the potential for boredom right so you don't want to go a lengthy period of time that they're that they're split yeah i, I, I agree 110 percent on this one it's so easy to get caught up in the story or, and in the the, the storyline or a plot of an individual, those two, and it's like, oh, it's progressing great, and you want to keep going, you want to keep going. Meanwhile, the other half tables twiddling their thumbs. So how do you manage that time then? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some advanced GMing techniques, not today, in part four, on how to do that. Today you get snippets. Yeah, today we'll give you, today we will give you a little taste, right? So when, you're, when your party's split, if... If it's split too long, you get the boredom, right? But what if things are moving along in a nice clip at one of the splits? Then, you know, you're almost, you're reluctant to bring them back together and, yet, yeah, and you're reluctant to stop and, and pay attention to the other half, right? And that's where the, that's where the pitfalls happen. So what you want to use is cutscenes, and you want to use frequent cutscenes. So I like to use it like kind of like a lightning round. What are you doing? You know, and move move from one one half of the split. You know, tell me what you're doing. And then the scene is set up, and this is happening, and use mini cliffhangers, and then boom, almost immediately cut over to the next half of the split. 
And sometimes it's easier if you just kind of rearrange seating a little bit. Okay, one half on this side of the table, the other half on the other. So you're focusing your energy to your right, and then boom, you're focusing your energy to the left. And use those cut scenes like really quickly. I agree. I agree. And it is a, a technique that works amazingly well. And I think out of that, the whole thing, mini cliffhangers. There's that point where it's like, oh, and and what happens next? Okay, over to this side. Ah, oh, crap! You know, and it you don't want to cut away, but the players are be on the edge of their seat, going, "What am I next? What am I next? What am I next? What am I next?" Because if you're moving quick enough, it's going to come quick enough. They're not going to lose that momentum, but now they're thirsting for it. Yeah, and then now it, you're. And then you pull the rug out from underneath again, and, then, and you're waiting for them to come back around. They're not going to lose interest. Right. They're going to pay attention to the other half of the table. Number one, A, to see what's going on. And B, all right, is it my turn yet? Is it my turn yet? Is it my turn yet? So it, I think that they said the, the, the important part there for me was mini cliffhangers. And you know, the tension's my, building. Yes. Right? Because if you're cutting from one one scene to the next, back and forth, then they have a little time to formulate their plan of action, that one half or, or the other half, but they don't have a lot of time. You know, so it's like, okay, you know, we got, we got to lay out a plan because it's, it's our turn next. Okay. It's right now. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing? And that builds tension that keeps momentum going at a nice clip and you don't get that boredom. You don't get the twiddling your thumbs like Bill was talking about at the beginning here. And for, for some of you that use tablets, phones, and or laptops out in front of you to keep your material on, download a digital two minute timer. Set the little two-minute timer and just keep resetting, resetting, resetting to per person. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. It doesn't have to be – you don't have to lock it in there. But that way you have a, a, a gradient, a, a, a sense of time there, whether it's a little hourglass or an actual ticker, something like that. It gives you a reminder that, all right, I need to keep things moving. I need to keep things moving. Don't get bogged down. Wait for that moment. Good place to stop. Okay, next. And off you go. Because there's, there's literally infinite amounts of – materials out there now on the interweb that you can use and put in the bottom corner of your screen and just a quick little click, quick little click, and just keep that ticker going. And that'll, for the for least experienced uh, people or people who, even your more experienced players that get caught up in the, the moment along with the players, you need a little reminder sometimes. So in the corner of your screen, a little, a little stopwatch, and set it up for two minutes and just keep resetting it. Two, three minutes, whatever you think you need. But it'll keep that pace and that constant cadence. And I think that's, like you said, really important to just kind of cut back for cut back, cut back. So they can try to formulate a plan. And just as that plan is germinating, now hopefully they start getting really good at it. And it's like, you do this, you do this, you do this. All right, I got you. I know where you're going. Boom, and, and ready to go. And in that few minutes... They've actually managed to come up with a, an effective plan. But that, again, is, is character development and player development. Uh, agreed. And in what is perhaps the most bizarre twist of fate ever to happen, uh, Bill is talking about using digital tools as a timer. And, and I, to be honest with you, am a big fan of the hourglass. I like the hourglass, and I actually have an hourglass. You know, and with an hourglass so, with a two-minute timer on it, you flip yep. it over, and now they're watching the sands pour through. Yep. And this is what time you have, so here you go. This is the lightning round. What are you doing? Boom, flip it over. What are you doing? Boom, flip it over. What are you doing? And keep that keep that pacing because it's the lack of pacing, as we said before, that will kill a split party. And now it's time for a break. Grab your elephant guns and your hunter orange because we're hitting the stars, nerds. It's space dinosaur season. Head off on a space adventure every week with The Homebrew, a D&D play podcast. Sure, there's lots of actual play podcasts out there. Heck, you can throw a rock and hit a dozen of them. But are any of these D&D podcasts sci-fi campaigns? You can't shake a stick at them because there ain't many, if any. And that's what sets these veteran gamers and their podcast apart from the sea of actual play podcasts. If you're new to D&D, old gamers like us, somewhere in the middle, or maybe you just like a good story, and who doesn't like a good story? Give the Homebrew, a D&D Play podcast, a listen. You can find them on the web at thehomebrewpodcast.com or anywhere podcasts are found. The links are in the description below. Welcome back. 
right? It's just going to destroy the enjoyment. So those quick cutscenes, those are the way to go to keep that pacing up. Now, what about combat? Big Com- combat, right? Huge, sweeping, epic combat. The Siege of Helm's Deep. Um, no. 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 Absolutely no. not. Uh, Small-scale combat. Quick encounters. Uh, harrying. Yeah. One little guy that jumps out at you, and and you can use the death of a thousand cuts kind of uh, application as you're going through a dungeon or a forest or brownies are shooting at you constantly. This little arrow here, little arrow there, one two points, one two points, one two points, but it's constant, it's consistent. You're not going to keep throwing heals on you for two three points damage, but after a while that starts building. Yep, and then as you're getting to the conclusion of this particular encounter, now you are down half your hit points, you're coming across something big, and you don't have time to heal. Tension skyrockets again. Drama skyrockets again. Now it's, oh, now what do we do? You know, and, and if the party's still split, and you're still running that two-minute egg timer, you see people getting nervous, and that's fun to watch. Yeah, and that's that's the tension building up. Right, because you're fleeing from something that's chasing you, and you run right into a bigger batter, Mm -hmm. and now you have something in front of you. Now you have something behind you, and now you cut over to the next half of the group. Who's going through something very similar. Something very similar. Or they have something coming at them, but they're up against an obstacle or a trap, or you know they're stuck between a rock and a hard place as opposed to in the other group is stuck between teeth and claws. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is have the, the party split end around this time. So now there's a convergence, right? So whatever it was that was, was harrying one half is still in pursuit and whatever's harrying the other half is still in pursuit. And now both halves kind of converge on this bigger batter. So now you have the bigger batter to contend with, plus whatever else it is that's harrying either side of the party. And now you have, you know, you have a a Mm four-way. And that is always a good place to end the session. Yes. They said, you know, you you have your two combats, or you actually manage to get your group together. Yay, we're all together. But guess what? These are following us. Oh, yeah, we got stuff following us, too. And meanwhile, the big bad standing in front of you going, boy, it's about time you got here. And it's like, oh, um, now we're really effed up, aren't we? (laughs) And then we'll call it there for the night, guys. We'll see see you next week. See you next week. Yeah, yeah, just make sure you think on that. Oh, man. Love it. Love it. Combat's not the only place to to build tension. No, it sure isn't. Um, puzzles. Like I said, you know, one group is stuck between a rock and a hard place. The other group's be- stuck between teeth and claws. Teeth and claws is obviously going to turn into combat, but that rock and the hard place where you're set for timing and maybe this giant stone obstacle is slowly working its way down. You've tried to shim it and put things underneath it and jam the pitons and... It's too big, it's too heavy, it's closing on a slow rate, and you need to solve some kind of puzzle to either get out, stop it from falling, or stop the room from filling with water or sand or venomous snakes or whatever. Uh, You're not in combat, but that tension level is still way up there because you still have a, a difficult puzzle or obstacle to overcome. You don't have to hack your way through it. No, and it could be just as lethal as combat. Oh, absolutely. Or maybe you're fleeing from a a weather disturbance. You know, maybe there's um, some sort of bad uh, bad weather coming, or 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 something to drive you to seek shelter, and you're you're running at breakneck speed through the the forest, and now here you are with that same kind of death by a thousand cuts scenario. Only now it's pricker bushes and branches and leaves and, you know, trip hazards, that sort of thing. And people are falling and people are being scratched and poked and gouged. and Have movement, failed deck save. Oh, you're not moving at all. You're caught up in the briars. Meanwhile, those black clouds are getting closer. You look around you. There's busted up and charred trees everywhere. Oh, that's right. This mountaintop's known for the storms and the electrical storms. Everything gets hit by lightning up here. Oh no. Yeah, or as 
as you uh, watch the black cloud that's moving faster and faster, you realize it's not actually a cloud, but it's made up of thousands of teeny tiny insects. The swarm. Yeah. And uh, whereas one or two will not be any sort of, of issue for anyone, something of that massive number where they're just just biting you and easily slain, but there's a ton of ton of them and maybe you're making saving throws because maybe they're a little venomous after you know several bites and you're starting to feel lethargic and ill and now you're slowing and you're still trying to get through the you can do a lot of stuff without having it actually be combat combat yep and can be very 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 tense well now that you know they're got to fall back on spells they got to fall back on skills they have to fall back on knowledge because obviously the weapons aren't working Right. Or, or just not applicable. So they have to use other things on their sheet aside from the little weapon stat. And they may have to dig into some of their own personal knowledge too. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, that is always something to add to the table because your players, you don't want them to get used to certain tactics used by the GM because they will outwit you once they get. Oh, yeah, well, it's it's many versus one. Yeah. So you got to change up. And you we're we were still talking about a split party. So now you have to come up with two different ways to harry two different groups that is not based on combat or if one is and one isn't. And then later on you reverse it. And maybe the group that went through first got through that swarm, but now the swarm's moving towards the second group. And maybe the swarm changes a little bit because just they're sitting across the table. Oh, well, I, I would have done this. Oh, here comes a swarm. I'm going to start lighting torches. Okay, go ahead. Did I tell you that this locust is unaffected by, by, by flame? Well, yeah, that the swarm that looks a lot like locust and bites a lot like locust, a little bit bigger, seem to be somewhat flesh-eating because you can see them encircle that little rabbit over there, and in minutes, the rabbit's down to bone, and most of the bone's missing too. So, yeah, I don't think the flame's going to work. How to you know change your monster on the fly, but you still got a, a split party. Don't make it obvious as to what will get rid of the swarm or the, the lightning storm. You're not going to get out of. They have to come up with skills and and spells and abilities, and who knows? Maybe that the with the lightning in the air, some spells aren't going to work because you're trying to draw on the border of Theral, and this the air around you is electrically charged, it could be fouling your spells. So there's a certain percentage of spell failure as well. Tension goes up a little bit more. Yeah, or you have a combat encounter, but your combat encounter is with your your half of the table that is not combat-oriented. Mm-hmm. And you have a, a thinking and skill encounter with the half that is not not much of, not, not not the thinking end of the party, <laughs> you know. It's it's the breaking and crushing and and hacking and slashing end of things. And uh, now there's a puzzle to solve. Yep, uh, because you want to have a few gimmies at the table, but you don't want to you don't want to give them everything, right? Make them work. Yeah, make them work. There's a reason why you split the party, and a lot of it is to build some tension. Uh, get the drama level up. Again, introduce new information, material, persons, places, things. But you don't want it, like you say, you don't want it, it doesn't want to be a gimme. And you're right. I, I think we mentioned something like that in the previous episode, how you give one half the group a task or or an opposition that's more suited for the other half. And like, I wish so-and-so was here. Let them try to figure it out. Or what would this person do? Yeah, that's what would this person do? Um, okay, we're we're stuck up here and here comes the swarm and we can't fight it. We don't have the spells. I have a sword and a shield. Okay? We're going a la rumble belly. Everyone jump on the shield. We're going for a ride. We're gonna outpace the swarm <laughs> that's by it. going sledding. <laughs> Down the mountainside. Lean left. Why? Tree And it's gotta be interesting, right? It, or or you lose player interest. Your yeah. your split has to be has to be interesting. So when you're going to do that, 
you got to commit to it because it's got to be interesting, not just for one half of the table, but for the other half. Mm -hmm. So while one half is watching the table play it out, you want that half that's watching to, to kind of feel that tension and be entertained by what's going on at the other end of the table and vice versa. Yeah. If you hear a few, Oh shit from the, half that isn't playing, you know, you're doing a yeah, decent you're doing job. A pretty, pretty good <laughs> job, you know, and it's also got to be interesting for when the play is happening mm -hmm. be because it's, it's dangerous doing this because you could risk boredom, which is why we often said new, new dungeon masters should not really be attempting this until they get you know, their legs underneath them. They get a little bit more familiar with the system, the rules, writing their own scenarios, and more importantly, what your players are going to do. Because to effectively split the party, you got to have a decent idea of what they're going to do, so you can write to their strengths or their weaknesses yeah. to to get that level of of excitement and tension and drama that you're shooting for. And writing to those strengths and those weaknesses equally is what makes it interesting. Yes, it is a good way to flesh out some player backstory. Right, you're going to assume that if someone has been adventuring long enough with someone that they're going to have a little bit of information about what that other player character's backstory is. Even if you didn't hear it direct because you're not the confidant for that particular character, they said Cal and Higardine were, were relatively close. They knew a lot about each other. Maybe uh, Kasim did not, but Kasim got along pretty well with Cal. But Cal, or Kasim never talked to Higardine, but he knew all about him through Cal. Like I said, you've been adventuring for a while. It's like, well, gee, why did he do that? Oh, well, you know, when he was younger, this happened and that happened. Now, maybe paraphrased, but you hear it often enough in a couple, from a couple of different contexts and a couple of different people, you get a pretty good idea of where what happened and where it's going and his mindset. And So, yeah, you're right. If they've been adventuring for a while... And they've gone up through quite a few levels together. Even if you didn't hear it directly from the person, you got a pretty good idea what's going on. And that's a good way to flesh out another character's backstory to other people that might have, you know, picked up pieces throughout conversation with the individual or individuals, like you said, that were close to one another, sitting on the other end of the table and watching uh, pieces of another character's backstory play out is a very good way to do that and to keep keep an interest in the other player character because there's something really cool about a gaming table when other players are invested in other players' characters. Oh, very much so. And that's when that's when you, you strike on this, like, magic at the gaming table when you have a, uh, a character that dies and your table gets really Pissed. quiet. Yeah. Excuse me. Like, could you say, could you say that again? Yeah. No. No. He. You know. He's just a, a negative. What? Um. You know. All right. Who's Who's got? Uh. You know. Gentle repose or something. No. 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 He. No. He's dead. Yeah. Oh and, no. No. Not really. Not really. Yeah. You know. And. Uh, We've yeah. seen that a bunch of times when they mourn another player's characters. Yes. Passing. It's. It's. It's a good thing. And taking the opportunity during a split to watch a part of the backstory play out a little bit or f be fleshed out really is a good opportunity to get that, that interest in that other player character. That's also going to drive the, the story as well because they want to know more. Not only is it just, I need to know more about me and my character. I want more, but I want to know what that character is going to do. I want to know what that character has going. A piece of the background is revealed, and it it was a revelation to me as a different player. I didn't realize that. What else don't I know? Yeah, or maybe maybe you've got you know kind of common experiences. You know, they mm. they took place at different times with different individuals, but oh, though they were that's very similar to some of the experiences I had or, oh, maybe I judged them a little too hard because, you know, given these circumstances, I would probably end up like this character. Um, or, or worse. Or and worse. I, and, gee, they're holding it together pretty damn well. Um, what's their secret? And, 
you know, to the point where it's driving the story when this sort of thing drives the story more than just, you know, the black and white print on, on your notes, right? This drives the story in a much deeper level than, than, you know, you could have possibly planned for. And, and that there is the epitome of interesting. Absolutely. So you can definitely split your party. You have a number of different ways to do it. But the trick is to make sure it's for a good reason. Make sure you write to those reasons. Keep it interesting. Keep it fast-paced. And your table will not disappoint. And that's Splitting the Party, Part 3, How to Run It Effectively. See you next week in the dojo. That's going to conclude this episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Please subscribe to the podcast for more great content. If you'd like to hear a particular topic, you can reach us on Facebook at the Dungeon Masters Dojo. Or you can drop us an email at the Dungeon Masters Dojo at gmail.com. Thank you and have a good day.